Okay. I think we're live. Yeah. So we're going to just welcome everybody here for the first few minutes. Um, and if you feel like letting us know where you're coming from or where you are watching from, that'd be pretty cool for us to see. I think that there's quite a few people online here today. Oh, wait. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So where's everybody from? I'm not uh, I'm not sure if this, yeah, this chat box should be open. So here. Where Ooh, are I've you? Oh, Sarah. Huh. Sarah, I've just got a delivery coming. I'll be one minute. I'm so sorry. I'll just be one second. It's a delivery man. Okay. <laughs> So funny, Lara had to run to the door. <laughs> so we're gonna wait just a second for her to come back. <laughs> All good. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, welcome everybody. My name is Sarah Luisma and I have Dr. Lara Bryden here with me today to talk about breaking up with a pill. And um, I want to let you know that you're in the right place if you're experiencing irregular bleeding, PCOS, difficulty losing weight, if you're feeling tired, nauseous, cramping, if you've got infertility, feeling like you've got some dryness in your vagina, if you've got hair loss, there's a anxiety, depression, all kinds of crazy things happening in your body when, um, when you're on the pill. And I also want to let you know that you're in the right place if you're here for finding more vibrancy in your sex life, if you're here because you want to have children soon, if you're here because you want to feel healthier and more connected to your body, if you want to feel more stable in your moods and less depressed, um, you're here also, you're in the right place if you want to have some questions answered about whether hormonal birth control is actually safe. If you want to talk about the responsibility of being on some form of birth control and having a little bit of anxiety or confusion in your community about what, um, what is right and responsible. And so we're going to be talking about all of these things today and debunking some of the the big untruths about pill bleeds and about hormonal birth control and giving you some tools that really make you feel like you have empowered choices for your health, fertility, and sexuality. So um, I want to tell you that we'd love to have you stick around till the very end because we've got a special offer. Dr. Laura Bryden has written a book called The Period Repair Manual and she'll be offering um, a promo for the first two or three chapters Free, free uh, three, oh, a free download of the first three chapters. Yeah. Um, so that will be towards the end of the webinar. Yeah. So, um, Laura, do you want to start off by telling uh, these amazing folks a little bit about yourself and how you came to be passionate about working with women in this way? Sure. And I just wanted to add something to, you know, everyone, you're here, you're in the right place. If you have tried coming off hormonal birth control before, and run into problems and failed. I know it can be quite scary, especially if you're not getting most, you know, most of you probably are not getting any support from your family doctor or your GP or possibly even your gynecologist about exploring alternative methods of effective birth control and also, you know, reestablishing a normal, mm -hmm. healthy menstrual cycle, which I do believe is possible for everyone. You know, I've worked with thousands of women in this process in my work as a naturopathic doctor over the last 20 years. So, you know, a lot of my sort of nine to five work is just speaking, hearing women's stories about their health, you know, some of their sort of questions about what's going on with them. And a lot of the time, you know, over, and I think what brought me to this work and brought me to this book is a lot of the time I, you know, I'm sitting there, I know from my experience with other women that the symptoms that I'm hearing, you know, the depression, the anxiety, the chronic recurrent yeast infections, the low libido, the weight gain, the hair loss, 
I'm sitting there with them, my, my, you know, my lovely patients, and I know that it's from hormonal birth control. And so it's just been a conversation of have you considered the possibility that this steroid drug that you're taking every day is actually a big contributing factor to you know, why you're not where you'd like to be with your health. Mm -hmm. How did you, um, how did you come to be working with women in this capacity? What was the, what was the moment in your career where you were like, oh, this is what I need to be doing? Yeah, I think it was just a natural evolution. I started my first years of, sort of general practice were in a little small mountain rural town and I was happy to I was willing to treat every, I was happy to treat everyone so I was getting men and women of all ages but just slowly slowly it was the you know the, the women coming to me and their stories that yeah just kind of ignited something in me a, you know like a, a passion a concern about the way they're you know they're they weren't getting the answers anywhere else and also about how powerful changes with the diet and you know stress reduction and herbal medicine how powerful that can be women's bodies respond to that extremely well because we're dynamic creatures and yeah so i think that was just my what started the whole journey for me how about for you yeah so um when i was hmm, when i was 16 i was prescribed hormonal birth control because um i was starting to become sexually active and that was that was it it was like this is what you're going to if you're going to be responsible and be sexually active you have to be on the pill and there were there was not really a conversation about safety or about long-term effects and I, I i don't even know if i knew a lot about that then um so i started taking it and then um immediately had some really crazy hormonal mood swings and some, you know, it, it exacerbated what was already happening in me as a teenager. And um, I went through this kind of custody, custody crisis, so to speak. We changed custodies from living with my father to living with my mother. And that experience was a catalyst for this complete downward spiral in my emotional health. And I have every... I have every confidence in, in my body in, in processing hormones. But when I was on birth control, there was, there was some, there was an interrupt there. And it, and I kind of have this feeling that it set, it set in motion something um, in my neurology in a way that I don't quite understand yet to this day. But I feel like when we mess with the hormones, the way that we do, and we take our body's natural hormone, shut them down and, and add synthetic instead, things go kind of crazy with us. And that was definitely my experience as a 16 year old. And I um, control for a, a, about five or six years. And then I started listening to my body and realizing that this is weird. This is not how things are supposed to be. I feel sick. And so I stopped taking it. And, um, and I was off it for a little while and I felt pretty good about that. And then at another point I was experiencing um, severe cramping and really hard, intense, um, PMS and, and like heavy flows and so my doctor told me to go back on it and at that point I was I was like god I don't like this I don't like how it makes me feel and yet this is what's being prescribed by my doctor and so I listened to my doctor at that point and um, went back on it and had the same crazy hormonal experiences and then I've I, I finally kind of connected with some other women who were who were speaking the truth about hormonal birth control and I was like got off it and got off it for good and felt really um good and empowered about that decision and ever since i came to i came to that place of of ownership and feeling powerful in my own body and just trusting my womb trusting my pussy in a way like knowing that 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 health indicator is here um i got really passionate about sharing that with women and so um, I, over the course of the last 15 years, have been working with women in different, um, in different modalities in the health and wellness industry. And now um, I work with women around sexuality and sensuality and coming back home to their bodies in a way that 
allows them to flourish in their lives in a way that allows them to come into their biggest visions and dreams and goals for themselves in a way that allows them to really fully experience life as pleasurable. And that all starts with owning our reproductive health. And I feel like this conversation here with talking about breaking up with the pill is the first step in coming back into connection with our bodies. So this topic is kind of at the root of what um, fuels me in my women's empowerment work and my coaching. Yeah. So it's interesting, it's interesting because I, I talk in my book a little bit about the libido of teenagers. I mean, it's a, you know, maybe for some parents, that's an uncomfortable idea, but teenage girls are sexual creatures. And I mean, even if they're not sexually active, it's, it's not about that. It's, you're right. It's, it's kind of more of a, you know, a feeling, a sort of a sensuality, a vitality and hormonal, hormonal birth control castrates that. I mean, it, it really, not to mince words, it actually induces a menopause state with our hormones. And you're doing that, you know, if, if you do that to a teenage girl, that's why they lose their libido. Um, they don't, but they don't, at such a young age, you know, 14 year old may not even have yet had a sense of what her own libido is like, which I find really sad. And half the time when I talk about this, I get a bit teary just thinking about it yeah. because it, some of the research is quite scary that, um, after, for some women, not all women, but for some women after spending some years on hormonal birth control, the decline in libido may be to some degree permanent you know we don't know but it's like how do we know if they never knew what their what was for them what was a normal sex drive you know will they ever just rediscover that when they finally come off the pill in their 30s and it's very sad and i think we need to have a yeah you know have a discussion of a conversation about the value of women's sexuality even as teenagers that is really um inspiring i feel like there's a there's an unfortunate shaming and um ooh yeah there's there's not space for um for for young children to explore themselves sexually without feeling shamed and there's not um there's not conversations happening in most households about that and so people are getting imprints really early about sex and sensuality and pleasure being bad and having this relationship with their body in a way that is adverse and then yes <laughs> well it's just that's the, like a mild way to put it yeah. and then you know then we get into sexual activity and hormonal birth control becomes this this necessary evil not to get pregnant you know it's not um it doesn't matter. Okay, we could go on a tangent here. What I really want to say is that there are some incredible methods and tools that we have to talk about. Okay. Yeah. And I think I'm going to let you kind of launch into that, Lara. Some of the alternatives and yeah. Okay. Yeah, we should speak about effective birth control because I expect that's what a lot of the audience, you know, is here to today, this morning, tonight to talk. It's morning where I am. It's night where you are. Um, <laughs> Um, just want, I just want, before we launch into that though, I do also just want to respond to the mood changes that happens, especially in young women, I think teenagers, and it, it's not mysterious, you know, as to why the hormonal birth control affects mood. We know it happens. There was just recently a massive Danish study of 1.4 million women where they were able to establish a very clear, clear link between hormonal birth control, all methods and depression and anxiety. And they don't, in that study, they didn't go so far as to discuss mechanism, but we know the mechanism. I'll tell you the mechanism. Female hormones affect the brain. They mold the brain structure. They're neurotransmitters, essentially, as well as hormones. So when you, when you shut that, so that's estrogen and progesterone, and they're both beautiful hormones, have a strong effect on mood. And when you shut them down, turn them off, and replace them with other drugs called levongestrel and drospirenone, and they're not hormones, the, the drugs in hormonal birth control, they, that changes the brain structure. There was some interesting research out of Berkeley that shows that women who take hormonal birth control have a differently shaped brain than women who don't, which is quite frightening, deeply frightening, when you think about the last three generations of young women who are, and, and, and again, so if they just start to just experience. Who are developing. Yes. Their brains are developing. Yes. <laughs> and if a 14-year-old 
you know, this is what the story I'll hear is, you know, when on hormonal birth control for skin, it's a common one. It's not, not always to be sexually active. It's, you know, often for skin problems or irregular periods, which we'll talk about. And then maybe nine months later, they're, they're displaying, you know, new symptoms of depression and anxiety. And then the doctor thinks, okay, well, it's because, you know, in high school, you know, dealing with new challenges of school. So here comes the antidepressant and that duo that that I see that in clinics so often that in the story of my patients is like hormonal birth control, bam, less than a year later, antidepressant. And it's not somehow someone's not hasn't been connecting the dots of what is going on with these girls. And and it, you know, you can't blame the girl or even the parents. You know, it's they're just really just doing as they've been guided to do. So on that topic, how what's a way to, you know, just, what are real birth control options for girls yeah actually i really like it when you talk about pill bleeds yes not being can you can you just talk like this is really enlightening the first time i heard you speak about it yeah so there's this delusion you know i call it the emperor's new clothes this sort of really strange idea that a monthly pill bleed is somehow similar to a real period it's not at all there's no reason so when you when you take hormonal birth control drugs, they like I said they shut down your hormonal system, and then you really don't need to bleed at all. The only purpose of the kind of withdrawal, the monthly timing of a drug withdrawal bleed, was to mimic. You know, there's a whole kind of history of it. It was originally to make the pill seem more acceptable. You know, sort of to um, mm. seem, somehow seem natural. But from the very beginning, it was a smokescreen. It doesn't. And modern, I mean, in modern birth control, they, they know this. I mean, that's why they're trying to talk women into using just long-term injections and implants and things where you don't bleed, you know, you just bleed kind of randomly. Um, but they're not real periods. A real period is about health. You know this. Like a real period is about the healthy functioning of our ovaries and our uterus too. But mainly, you know, I always come back to the ovaries because they are our power centers. I mean, that's where the hormones, that's how we make hormones. And to, sh and so, you know, the, a, a healthy monthly cycle for a month, a, a monthly cycle is a sign of health because it's a sign that the ovaries are able to do what they need to do on, you know, sort of roughly a monthly cycle. It doesn't have to be exactly 28 days, but that's, you know, that's a sign of health. And that on the topic of teenage girls, that they're not going to be at a monthly cycle straight away. That's okay. I mean, they can take a few years for their ovaries to kind of get going. They're getting calibrated. They're just kind of getting the lay of the land and then absolutely no reason to put a 14 year old on the pill to induce a monthly drug withdrawal bleed. Like it's, it's <laughs> meaningless. <laughs> We're going to regulate your periods by shutting them down, <laughs> by shutting down your hormones. Yeah. It's strange. It's How a very strange to this point. How could they ever legally be able to say that that is true? I just don't understand how we got to this point. It is a very strange time. It's a strange time in medicine. I'm convinced future generations will look back at this and just think like one of those like the way we look back at what doctors used to do a century ago and think that was really weird. This has been very strange. And yet in their defense, you know, a lot of the doctors that I talk to, I mean, they, they seem to believe it. I mean, they, they are trying to do the best thing for their patients. I know that because they're good people. So I don't, you know, I just think it's been a, a massive kind of misinformation campaign. Like I said, kind of an emperor's new clothes situation, a very weird situation for women. And it's going to change. It's starting to change already. There's a, there's a you know, there's a revolution. Well, the first chapter of my book is called Period Revolution. It's like women are kind of... And I get, I, every day I get messages and comments on my blog of women saying kind of like, what, what you mean? I mean, it works by shutting down my hormones. And it's like, I don't, I never, why did no one ever explain that to me before? Like, I'm really, you know, I need to spread the message about that. So I'm hoping the message and even listeners tonight or to, you know, today will take that message to the other women they care about and sort of think about that for their daughters and for themselves. You know, we mm -hmm. can, as women, we benefit from our own hormones. We deserve to have our own hormones. And we, going forward, we can. Um, yeah. <laughs> what are some of the benefits of um, 
of having our hormones healthy yes. and functioning. Yeah, so many. Yeah, mood, libido, big ones. I'd say mood is top of mood is absolute top of my list because both both hormones, estrogen and progesterone, are highly beneficial for mood. And I know that some people might be sitting there in the audience thinking, well, that doesn't feel right because I get you know this premenstrual mood that somehow relates to my own hormones. That's that's different. That's about and I talk in my book about having with other, you know, being as healthy as you can in other ways so you have a resilience to the kind of natural fluctuations of our hormones. They do fluctuate. And the reason we sometimes feel that when they fluctuate is because they are powerful on the brain. They're, they're beneficial hormones. They, you know, prevent aging. They're anti-aging. <laughs> they stimulate metabolic rate. So, you know, good for healthy, just maintaining a healthy body weight. Um, they're good for bone health. One of the concerns about, especially a lot of doctors are raising this concern, putting teenagers on hormonal birth control means they never obtain their what's called peak bone density. So they miss that opportunity to kind of build bones to where they're supposed to be in our mid, kind of mid twenties is when we are at our kind of strongest and most dense bones. They don't get there. And some methods like the Depo-Provera injection, which is the contraceptive injection, which is absolutely the I'll say is the worst method out there. It causes bone loss. And for a while they were pretty worried it was, you know, irreversible bone loss. But now they think maybe if women come, you know, when women come off, they can regain some of the bone that they lost. Muscle mass, you know, um, exercise kind of performance. There's a lot of athletes now talking about, wait a minute, I don't, you know, when I'm on hormonal birth control, I don't have the power, I don't have the strength to do the sport that I need to do. Um, <laughs> so many things, you know, our, our hormones are beneficial for skin and hair. The, a lot of the, um, one of the synthetic hormones called levongestrel, synthetic progestin, causes hair loss. And the American Hair Loss Association knows this. They say anyone with a, you know, history or family history of hair loss should never use that birth control, and yet it's the most common one prescribed. The hair loss starts a few years into it usually, kind of as gradual, and after five years on the pill, it's like, wait a minute, why is my hair half the density that it used to be. And that takes a long time, I'll be, I'll be honest, that can take, that pill-induced hair loss can take years to recover, which is very tragic and very, yeah, very upsetting to a lot of women. Um, we're getting some comments. I asked a question, what do you yeah. want us to debunk? And okay. um, Kimberly says, she's sold on getting off the pill. Okay. <laughs> concerned with the transition and also effectively not getting pregnant. And yes. Chris says, what's the easiest transition to getting off the pill? She's daughter's been on for six months and she's got acting and pain during her cycle and she has extreme anxiety. Oh, and then, okay. oh, and then uh, you can't see the top ideas to come off the pill and control the hair loss and acne. So um, yeah, everybody's acne. convinced at this point. Um, yeah, we don't need to debunk. We don't need to kind of go on about the pill. They're here because they know that. Yeah, they know, they know this. Okay, This fair is enough. just good because you can tell your sisters now this is in your brains. Okay. And, yeah. Okay. So let's just, I'm just going to run through effective birth control methods first, if that's okay. Let's just kind of like just a practical list. And these, these are effective even for teenagers because it's a real problem. I don't want this work and this message and I don't want this to lead to unwanted pregnancies because I agree that women, that's another part of control that we need to have in our lives is to choose when, if and when we have children. So um, one thing I'll straight away say is um, it's not enough to just, so we are, as, as women, so men are fertile every day of their lives. <laughs> women, we are fertile only six days per cycle. So that's important information. That's information that I think girls should be taught from an early age because we're, we're taught the opposite that you could fall pregnant, you know, become pregnant on any day, which is very confusing. But the, the trick is to figure out those days and you it's, it's do very doable to figure it out, but you cannot really simply rely on what your phone app is telling you. If your phone app happens to say, this is your ovulation window and that's not enough that can lead relying on that solely without using other signs, physical signs such as temperature, could result in an unwanted pregnancy. So that's a message that, because I've been lately hearing a lot of, you know, teens, early 20s women, they tell me that's what they're doing for birth control. It's not going to work. So it needs to be done in conjunction with basal body temperature. So measuring a temperature every morning to indicate ovulation. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
And what do you think about um, tracking cervical fluid? And the fluid, yep. So depending on the method that you're learning, so you can need to you need to learn this method from somebody. There's lots of online service people teaching the method. There are books about the method to learn to track either on paper or on a, or in a period app. You can use an app for that tracking, and there's some apps that are specifically kind of designed for that purpose to use in conjunction with temperature and and possibly mucus as well. The cervical what are your fluid favorite, uh, apps. Well, I I know Kindara has one that you know works for um, fertility tracking. I guess the one, um, and I'm happy to hear what some of yours are as well. I do, I'm a big fan of the DAISY contraceptive device as well, which is more than an app. It's a little thermometer computer which uses their algorithm to track, to determine fertility is based on, I think tens of thousands of sort of women's cycles. What are some other apps that your clients are using for birth control um the one that i use is called the woman app okay it's kind of a funny name and okay. it is just a calendar but um i don't use it that way i i can track my ovulation and i can track my um temperature it has a lot of opportunities to get specific if you misuse it just like you were saying earlier a calendar by itself is not enough no um Okay, there are actually there are lists that come, there are some lists because actually there was a study recently done. I'll, I'll try to find the link for the listeners later. Uh, like ranking, they went through some scientists went through and looked at all the apps on the market and kind of ranked who was like which of them were effective for contraception. So we can I'll put that link later. Okay, but it's a, yeah. I mean it's a great method, and I'll just say I think basically I think all young women should be fertility tracking anyway, even if they're going to use another method such as condoms because. It's just such a good way. It's so empowering to know when you're fertile. And then I think even, you know, even teenagers who are sexually active can say, look, no, I'm on my peak fertile day. I'm not going to have sex today. Like, you know, it's. Yes, it's absolutely. And I think that the, uh, the things that changed for me when I started tracking my fertility were, um, it was not just about not getting pregnant. It was about being in touch with my femininity. And I, I would, you know, I would look at my vagina and I would put my fingers inside and feel my cervix. And I got very intimate with this down there area that, you know, we can get really hands off and disconnected from. And I feel like there's a, there's a really, um, there's a cost to being disconnected from your sexuality and from, and from knowing your body's rhythms. And when, I mean, I've gotten so sensitive that I can feel when I ovulate, I physically feel it. And this is possible. And this is really, like you said, very empowering to know yeah. where you are in your cycle because you can give yourself so much permission to feel sensitive or to feel sexy and to feel turned on because you're like, oh, yeah, I'm ovulating. Or, <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah, that's true. I, I, it is a little bit um, – I am a little bit sensitive. My, my, my period is coming soon, and maybe I should not go – push myself really hard. Like this is the kind of way we learn to take care of ourselves. This is the way we learn to be our own best friend, connecting with our fertility cycle in a way. I feel like it's a really big window into empowerment. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. And knowledge. Yeah, self body literacy is the term that I love that term. Me too. That's awesome. Understanding our bodies. And also it's also a way for doctors uh, or patients or women and to communicate with their doctors if they're not ovulating like to, to sort of it's a because our period is our what's called the fifth vital sign and just earlier beginning of 2016 the american like, society of obstetricians and gynecologists came out with a statement a joint statement with the pediatrician society saying all doc saying doctors should ask all of their patients about their periods because the period is a sign of health Knowing if, a, knowing if a girl or woman is ovulating regularly is important information for health because a lot of women aren't. And so, you know, if they're not, then it's for a reason that can be fixed, an underlying reason such as something like PCOS or thyroid or, it's, or under, under nutrition. Um, that's an important thing to kind of know early on and not just mask that with the pill because the problem's not going to go away just because you've induced a pill bleed. <laughs> um, so we'll talk about that a bit more. I might just kind of go through for the listeners, like just some of the other 
methods of contraception. I mean, obviously something like we've been talking about a fertility awareness method or DAISY contraceptive device is my first choice. You know, I think that's the, the best, it's for so many reasons, it's a good choice. Um, but I'm realistic. I mean, and for some women, some women prefer other options. So I really do, do want to speak about um, the copper IUD because I'll share with you, it's actually the copper IUD is actually I, quite a, a few of my kind of naturopathic doctor colleagues, that's their method of choice. So, you know, it's, it's, it's out there as a method. Um, just for your listeners, it's a, it's a little device that looks like an earring that the doctor inserts through the cervix into the uterus. It's not surgery to have it put in. It's just a little, quite a quick in-office procedure. Kind of feels like a really strong menstrual cramp when it goes in. And has contains the copper IUD contains no hormones. It prevents pregnancy by the copper ions inhibit sperm, and then the presence of the device inhibits um, just prevents implantation. And it, it can stay in there for like ten years. It's sort of a it's actually of all the methods in in this one of the surveys I saw of all the methods of birth control, including you know it beats out all methods, including hormonal birth control, as the most the method with the highest rate of user satisfaction. So people, who, women who do use it successfully and like it, a lot of them really like it. They like just the kind of ease of it. Um, but some women, it can cause heavier periods, about 50% heavier than they were before. So what I say to women is, however, what your period is like now, it'll be like that, plus about half as much again in terms of the amount of flow. And there, you know, there can be um, some increased period pain after, and some women do report anxiety on it, which is, you know, I just have to acknowledge as a reality for some women. Mm -hmm. It is now considered, IUDs are considered suitable for teenagers. And I'm not, again, I'm not fully endorsed. I'm not saying every teenager needs to have that, but that's an option. Like if there's a teenager who is just not going to do fertility awareness method and doesn't feel responsible enough to do condoms, it's an option. And it doesn't interfere with hormones. Um, so the next method is condoms, of course, of which I, you know, I think are, Great, and there's some new condoms coming out that are thinner and kind of more comfortable and there's apparently one that's unbreakable um, called Hex Condoms, which I'm pretty excited about. And I'll tell you what, one thing, there's a disturbing kind of bit of research that came out recently that said that young people, sort of teenagers, um, the millennials, a lot of them, they're using condoms less than, say, my generation did because, and the reason is because they, they believe they're not effective. You know, they've sort of had this message that condoms are not, good enough as birth control or something and so they're not they're not using them which is I, I just, i'm trying to turn that message around i think condoms are effect they are effective and they're even more effective for example so with a teen you could say okay you know condoms on every occasion which really teens should be doing anyway to prevent sexually transmitted diseases and then um and then if a girl also has is tracking her fertility either with you know, something like Daisy or um, just, you know, just charting her own self with a, with a thermometer. She knows when she's ovulating. She has then the extra power and control to say, I'm not going to have sex at all on those days of peak fertility. I'm not even going to risk a condom on those days. But on the other days, you know, sort of, and that raise, that's going to raise the total effectiveness rate of condoms. Um, there's also the cervical cap which is um, like an, a, a barrier method that for women that um, little uh, sort of made of natural latex that you, it, you put over the cervix, um, which a lot of my patients like that method. We can talk more about that in the questions. And then I know people want to know about the Marina, the hormonal IUD. So what do you think, Sarah? Should we talk about that for a minute? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's hormonal birth control, so it, but it's a little bit different than other methods. So it's, um, so it looks similar, and it'll be often be presented kind of as if you know the copper IUD and the hormonal IUD are kind of just two versions of almost the same thing. They're actually quite different because the copper IUD has no hormones, doesn't affect hormone your own hormones at all. The hormonal IUD, which is Marina or Skyla, I think there's some different ones. They all get different names depending on the actual dose of the hormone that's coming out of them. Um, it, it doesn't affect, it doesn't shut down hormones the way all other methods of hormonal birth control do. It, um, 
it's supposed to work, it works more locally just to prevent the buildup of the uterine lining. But in theory, it should still prevent, it should, sorry, in theory, it should still permit hormonal cycling, which hmm. for that reason, you know, is potentially kind of the lesser evil of all the methods of hormonal birth control. But the research is that it does, it does still, even at small dose, does still prevent ovulation in a number of women, at least especially during the first year. And it also has been, it did quite badly in the Danish study, the mood kind of depression anxiety study um, with hormonal birth control. Marina actually did quite badly with that. So if there's a mood, you know, concerns about mood, then it, you know, I think is potentially not a good choice. Um, what are your thoughts about Marina? I'm just curious to get some feedback about. Um, you know, it's, I've had a couple of pretty progressive friends choose that method and I was surprised by that because they were told that it would not be the same effect as the pill on their hormones and um, I have not followed up with them but I'm 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 pretty much against hormonal everything so yeah I wouldn't recommend it and and there's a there's a there's something that I, I my body says hell no about IUDs in general. I don't think I would feel um, I don't feel like that would feel good in my in my body. So I don't I don't necessarily um, recommend them because of my own personal experience with it. But yeah. um, I do know that through my um, through my experience with my abdominal massage, which I have used with a lot of clients to help them regulate pill or excuse me period cramping and um and intense bleeds and kind of sometimes the the when you have brown blood at the beginning or the end of your period it's an indication that there's a, a uterine tip um that becomes really painful with um when you have an iud and, and sometimes contraindicated to do abdominal massage and uterine massage because um moving around with a, a piece of metal inside of your uterus can get a little bit painful and potentially even cause scar tissue. So I was curious what you thought about um, manipulating the uterus or if you've got any experience with doing that kind of work. Yeah, I don't have a lot of experience with it. I, I will say one thing, this is something I haven't really said in forums before, but so there is this kind of recurring issue of, so a lot of women do feel fine on the IUD. So, I mean, we have to, I have to just sort of acknowledge that, but there is quite a fair number of women who report anxiety, even from the copper IUD. And there've been ideas that it's the copper, somehow it's the copper toxicity, which is possible. But my instinct is it's more of a physical reflex. I think, I mean, because yes, the uterus is part of our body. I mean, it's part of our nervous system. It's part, I think, so I think for some women, the body doesn't like that. <laughs> I agree, possibly the body just doesn't like having something there. And I, yeah. that is not medically endorsed opinion. I mean, I, I don't say that in a lot of forums because I don't, there's no research to back that up, but it, it makes sense to me that, and that's kind of what you're talking about. Like the kind mm -hmm. of, the, it's like the body would know that's something that's not right. Yeah. There's something that is, uh, this is part of the conversation that I, I, I'm really passionate about here because our bodies definitely know what's right and what's not right for us. And we um, are, we're just, uh, got indoctrinated from such a young age to be disconnected from that wisdom and this is something that um, that I work with with my clients to kind of reconnect and uh, I'm, I'm really um, I'm looking forward to the day when everybody is walking around with a fully owned womb wisdom and then they know what's good for their bodies and what's not and then they don't second guess themselves when they feel like that's a that's a hell no to put that in there or yeah actually that's a yes and i feel like i don't need to double check with anybody about that yeah so. um there is one other method coming of birth control which i i do i'm i'm excited about i mean i don't know we can talk about this this is um for men it's called basal gel um so it's a reversible it's kind of like reversible fully reversible vasectomy so it's a little it's gel that would be injected that's injected into the tubes that what are called the vas deferens that so they block the sperm from entering the semen indefinitely like until so you get they would have the injection which it was not again would not be surgery it would just be like an in-office procedure that they would do with a local anesthetic and then 
when it when they want to have children a second injection to wash that away kind of remove it open it open the doors as you will to sperm and i just every time so i you know i sort of follow them on social media it, it's a my understanding is it's a non-profit organization who's trying to bring it to market they're encountering a lot of i think obstacles sort of getting that through clinical trials but i think you know, and they did. We recently did a survey of, and I think almost fifty percent of men said they were keen. You know, they would they would do this, and I've, and so I think, you know, certainly for young people, in terms of all the options we've just discussed, you know, for for teenagers, you know, this might be one of the simplest options. So hopefully, that's something like that, or maybe even other methods that we haven't thought about are in the future for us. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's. Hasn't been around long enough for much testing, I imagine. It's in clinical trials now, I believe. It's, so it's not available now. yet. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would be. In, I would have potentially similar, you know, risks as a vasectomy, but um, so we'll stay. We'll stay tuned. But you know, I'm excited about that for sharing the burden of birth control. So I don't think the burden should all be on women. Definitely not. Yeah. Um, so, um, Elena has uh, a comment here that she takes the pill because uh, the side effects of PCOS, like hair loss. Yes. Acne. And she's been on the pill for so many years for this reason, but she wants to stop it now because of the other side effects that she's experiencing, like melasma, low libido, spider veins. And she wants to know if we have uh, ideas of coming off the pill and controlling hair loss and acne. So, okay. I think Great. this kind of good transition to... This is a good transition. And also we can pick up on a question that came earlier about 10 or 15 minutes ago about, you know, acne and teenagers and, you know, what, because skin is a common, common reason to rely on hormonal birth control because it works extremely well to clear skin. And the reason is, well, one, you know, one thing about um, the drug using hormonal steroids to um, birth control steroids to control skin is they actually the certain some of them suppress skin oils and sebum production so much that it's to the level of a child which is quite interesting so they really oh. you know they 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 clear up skin dramatically but the, the cost to that is when you come off them because the skin has been the skin oils have been suppressed so much that they they just upregulate in response to that and then when you come off there can be skin oils and acne like never before this is sort of a post pill acne that it's a heavy cost to pay, I think, for having used those drugs, because um, it's to some extent that post pill for some women that post pill acne is not complete, not completely avoidable. We can help it, we can improve it with some of the treatments. We'll talk about the treatments in a minute, but specifically with regard to PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is a syndrome of excess male hormones. The thing to understand is, even though the hormonal birth control has kind of been the standard prescription for that it's not a good treatment for polycystic ovarian syndrome. And that is, that is the current view from really essentially any endocrinologist who kind of knows her or his stuff. You know, this is, this is not just natural therapists saying this. The, the problem with using the pill to treat PCOS is that it worsens the underlying problem of insulin resistance, something called insulin resistance. So the pill damages insulin sensitivity. So it's this crazy situation where it's, it's masking the symptoms, inducing a pill bleed, but the whole time you're on it, you're really just sliding deeper and deeper into the condition. So again, that's a heavy cost to pay for using that medication. Mm -hmm. So how to treat PCOS? Um, that's more than we can, I mean, I, I'll, I'm gonna say a couple things, but that's, you know, that's a, I've got a, a number of, I've written a few times on my blog about that. Chapter seven of my book is mostly about PCOS. It's about treating, identifying the underlying cause, which is usually insulin resistance, although it can be other, there can be other factors, and treating that with diet, like basically removing, so identifying a problem with insulin, then removing all sugary foods, which includes all desserts, all dates, all even kind of natural desserts, all agave syrup, all maple syrup, all honey, all fruit juice, that, food drives the condition so it's really it, it is necessary to get completely off it and if that's a challenge at least for a few months and if that's a challenge for people then they you know might need some extra support around you know um 
overcoming sugar cravings. Um, and then there are so some... You said for a few yeah. months, is that generally an average amount of time that people need to cleanse? Yeah, well, I don't think it's so much as a cleanse as just trying to, try to normalize, bring insulin down, can normalize insulin. So I say for a few months strictly, and then depending on how they're doing and response, maybe after, say, three to six months, it, it's possible to bring some of that back. So I'm just saying it's not, it's not like there'll be a lifetime of they can never have a piece of dried fruit. But, you know, to start with, it, it often has to be quite strict to make a change with the hormones. And... Certain nutritional supplements can be really helpful as well. I do talk about that in my book for, for PCOS, for reversing that. Which, um, oh, can, we, can we, I have a question here for Michelle. What are the best natural herbal remedies restoring ovulation if you have PCOS coming from adrenals? So, oh, from adrenals. Is that her question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, that's quite a different, see, that's an example. In my book and in my blog, I talk about the different kind of different types of PCOS. An excess of adrenal, what are called adrenal androgens or male hormones is actually quite a different condition than the standard PCOS that with that is caused by insulin resistance so look I'll just say well this is an answer to that specific question adrenal androgen excess is a lot to do with kind of regulating the stress response so um, potentially using magnesium to help kind of reduce stress hormones um, you know um, promoting a health like less reducing stress with style like that and also I use a herbal combination called peony and licorice to reduce testosterone androgens generally I talk about that in my book and zinc the, the supplement probably that reduces androgens or male hormones the most is zinc um, which is also extremely helpful for skin mm. has anti acne properties for many reasons the other wanted, yeah go ahead go ahead oh I wanted to say one other thing about the skin um, so oftentimes whether this is related to coming off the pill or, or not, um, people use facial cleansers that restrict the skin of natural oils and the body can continuously trying to, to, to replenish the oil because the oil is very healthy and, and its right balance is very healthy. So I yep. think one way to, um, to kind of keep that in check is there's, there's a really great like simple facial cleanser you can make yourself with with oil and you don't need to put some harsh chemical soap on your face to strip the oils off your body will find that its natural balance a little bit easier and especially in that sensitive period after you get off of your uh, off of home or birth control you can take care of your skin with uh, some non soap facial cleansers like creams or oil okay do you have anything yeah. you like particular there no I don't have any I just think about sort of particular products so talk, yeah no I don't have anything specific I think yeah just as um, sort of gentle and natural as possible I think my experience of skin is mostly from the inside it's mostly skin is largely diet driven although I mean, certainly when there's an, a PCOS situation the hormonal you know hormones are worsening that quite a lot one thing I'll just say as a general also for um, improving skin and for anyone coming off the pill or for teenagers that are looking for alternatives to going on the pill, um, removing cow dairy, including all like yogurt, cheese, milk, it can be right in, can be a game changer for skin. Mm -hmm. and we know that from the research and I just know that from clinical practice. It's just a very effective, yeah, very effective choice method to do to improve skin. Susie's asking uh, what to do when you come off the pill, but your period hasn't returned. Yeah. Yep. Common, common problem. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, it's uh, if you read the fine print of hormonal of the oral contraceptive pill, if you kind of dig in and kind of look at the you know the all the you know the the sheet fact fact sheet that they give with it, it does state there pretty clearly that it can take up to two years to reestablish ovulation after taking hormonal birth control which kind of makes sense because it's a drug that shuts down ovulation and the only way to get regular periods again is to start to ovulate so there's that I mean some women just take longer mm -hmm. so and I think what happens a lot of the time what makes me sad to see is you know they've only been off the pill three months they've got some breakouts which is just kind of the post pill drug it's kind of like a drug withdrawal really from the, the steroids and hormonal birth control um, the skin oils are surging 
Um, and then during that time, getting a diagnosis, possibly a diagnosis of PCOS, which is possibly not an accurate diagnosis at that time, in that window, post-pill window, of it, it can be pretty normal to have no periods and acne at post-pill for a while. And so, you know, we do as much as we can to mitigate that. But I think one of the most important messages for the audience today and is that that's not going to last forever. I mean, you know, the, the first three to six months off the hormonal birth control, it's not indicative of what's to come forever. I mean, that's a transition as you're, and the goal is to, the, what I talk about in my book is, you know, put on your detective hat and hopefully with the help of your doctor and figure out are there, what obstacles to ovulation are there now? You know, what, what, what do you need to do to support your body to get there, to ovulate? Because your body wants to ovulate. It really, truly does. It's a strong imperative. So if, if, the body's, if your body's not ovulating and so therefore not having periods, there's usually a reason. It could just be a post-pill kind of stall, a temporary stall, in which case something like the herbal medicine Vitex can be quite helpful, but don't take it too soon after the pill. Um, it could be a nutritional issue. It could be um, sort of excess sugar, excess insulin causing a PCOS picture. It could just be undernourished. You know, under eating is a common reason to not get periods as well. And that's quite common in young women, especially if they're trying to be super healthy. They're, you know, avoiding foods kind of like I've said to do, you know, avoiding sugar, avoiding dairy, but they take it further and they read somewhere on a blog to avoid carbs and avoid, ri and avoid rice and avoid everything. And they're vegetarian and they're basically not eating enough yeah. nutrition to get a period. So that's, <clears throat> that's a factor too. Yep. Uh, here's my two cents on the topic. Yeah. There's, um, <laughs> man, you know, methods and tools will only take you so far until at a certain point, your mindset is going to be the thing that makes all of this possible for you. A smooth, healthy transition off of hormonal birth control is completely possible for you. If your mindset is um, one of respecting and honoring your body's processes, if you're constantly pathologizing every little thing that's going wrong and freaking out about your broken body, it's going to be really hard for your body to naturally return to its rhythm. And the thing we have to remember is that, like you said, Lara, our bodies want to ovulate. At any one point, our body's expressing the most healthy expression of life that it possibly can. Even if there seems to be a lot of stuff going wrong, your body is trying to become healthy. It's constantly overcoming all of these obstacles that you put in the way, um, including a lifestyle that does not include um, healthy self-care or opportunities for pleasure and really respecting the natural functions of your of your your entire reproductive system but the pleasure that we have available to us if we aren't tapped in and tuned into what makes us feel good we're we're only looking at the the, the, the door closing of what feels bad and what's painful and what's wrong and what's sick that's going to be our entire reality so there's a mindset shift that I, I feel pretty strongly about when, when, we're, when we're making these transitions that um, there can be an opening somewhere, even though everything feels like it's closing, there's an opening somewhere where this feels good and there is a healthy movement forward happening in your body and being patient and understanding and respectful of that process for you being completely different from everybody else you're going to talk to and when I, even if the doctor says sometimes it's going to be different from what they think is going to happen so we get um we get into our heads and our stress thinking about what's happening and i think that that becomes another hurdle yeah i i agree i agree to sort of the mindset that it's possible to trust your body that's the final i think sentence of my book is to trust your body but i'll also i'll just add to that too that i don't you know i think also as women you know, a, a message we hear is sort of always sort of blaming ourselves for things too. So I do also don't want my patients to feel that, for example, if their skin's bad or if their period hasn't come, that it's something they've done wrong or some way that they've thought about things wrong or, you know, oh, I, yeah, I, absolutely. it's also kind of just recognizing too, your body is doing, yes, your body knows what to do. It's doing the best it can within the situation. There are some, you know, some, just some realities of the world that have, 
happen to you, you know, if you're put on the pill at a young age, your body has, that's a big obstacle it has to overcome. It will do it, Mm -hmm. but just recognizing that it's not, because I think a lot of women is like, if I could just eat some, is it just something I could eat differently or if I could think differently or it must be something I'm doing wrong as to why I'm not getting a period. And then finally, if, you you know, if they fail, then they just think the message I hear as well, you know, I can't do it. Maybe, maybe, you know, if, if I couldn't get a period, then it's because I must just, as you say, kind of be broken and need to be on the pill. And so I can share with your audience, I've got worked with women from all situations, all angles on the pill at 13 and worse and terrible situations. And there's always a way, there's always a way through. Just for some women, it takes longer than others. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think a lot of people, a lot of women feel like they're uh, in isolation and I hope that one of the major takeaways from this webinar, there are, almost 80 people here in attendance is that you your experiences are very common and and you're not alone and there are a lot of women that are experiencing what you're experiencing and that this is something we can talk about and relate to each other with that feels um it 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 feels really scary when we're experiencing things like endometriosis and we don't know what's going on and and we feel a, a lack of community around that so I hope that this kind of spurs a conversation with all of us. Yeah, just to okay, we'll finish with that. Endometriosis is a very scary, quite a serious condition. Um, so I just I do want to kind of say responsibly too that if you know if if the diagnosis has been endometriosis, if that that might be one sort of group of women or population where I would say don't just immediately necessarily rush off hormonal birth control because. Um, there are certainly, I mean, I need to sort of see the big picture. There are times, there are women for whom, you know, hormonal birth control has been helping them in some way and potentially hormonal suppression, you know, can be sort of preventing real, you know, serious pain. And and so endometriosis is is a big topic and I've written about it a few times. Um, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's, it's kind of a little bit separate from, you know, the, the other topics, the skin and the PMS and the period regularity, which are all things that are, we can take kind of a more, you know, gradual approach to, but endometriosis can be quite serious. Um, uh, someone has asked um, about this topic um, that every specialist they speak to tells them to stay on it because stopping uh, their period from happening is the best way to stunt the growth of endom- endometriosis. Okay. And they're asking, should they see an endocrine specialist in <clears throat> Okay, this is endometriosis is a big. So that this is exactly what I'm talking about. This so if if a, if there's a history of you know of surgeries and quite severe endometriosis, no, I don't want listeners to go away and just immediately stop their medication, which for their, their in their case is hormonal birth control. I think um, it does respond to natural treatment, but it needs there needs to be kind of a plan and to be done in you know in consultation with the gynecologist as well i guess one thing i'll say in closing um well there are a lot of women who who do manage to control endometriosis and prevent its growth without hormonal birth control it is doable it requires you know as i said a plan and i guess back to marina for a minute the hormonal IUD. there are times because we have to be realistic there are women out there that maybe have quite serious problems either endometriosis or um, another group would be um perimenopausal so women in their 40s that are have serious bleeding like flooding through their clothes and you know that that kind of bleeding (laughs) um which can respond to natural treatment but also realistically in those there are times when i think marina is an option it needs to be on the table as an option because 20 years ago before marina the option was hysterectomy so you know we need to you know think about and so Fortunately, when I started practicing 20 years ago, no, no, seriously, Sarah, when I started practicing 20 years ago, most women above 45 had had a hysterectomy. Like, I would say most. You know, it was kind of, it's like any kind of problem. It's like endometriosis, heavy periods, fibroids. It's like, let's just fix the problem by removing the uterus. And so you can see my thinking. I'm like, if you can take, potentially use Marina for five years, kind of get through to menopause, you know, survive hold your uterus keep your uterus i wanted to have this bumper sticker when i was living in you know this rural place in the mountains in canada i wanted to have this little bumper sticker that said 
keep your uterus. Like, hold on to your uterus if you can, because you need it, even at menopause. Oh, my God. They're so, so important. So this is another um, a, another thing that my abdominal massage does um, does approach um, and with pretty great success, in fact. So I would say that um, those of you that are dealing with fibroids and endometriosis, you might look into finding um, a, a my abdominal massage therapist who has done um, the higher level trainings because um, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of um, responsiveness to physical touch and embodiment um, through through manipulation and through care that way and internal pelvic floor and um, vaginal massage and dearmoring as well really important to get into our bodies and refamiliarize ourselves um, and our neurology in a way that you know, proprioceptively, we understand where our hands are, but we cannot feel into our cervix because we just don't have connection to that area as much. And I think that, that this connection definitely leads to dysfunction. So, yeah, just a, a final just parting thing too. Endometriosis is um, very active inflammatory disease. I, I, in my own work and from my interpretation of the research, I also put it in the category of autoimmune disease, kind of active autoimmune disease. It's kind of in the category of like rheumatoid arthritis and it's quite serious potentially conditions. So when people are looking at natural strategies for that, I think it's important to kind of sort of bring in some of that, you know, strong anti-inflammatory treatment that's available from diet and supplements. And I, but I certainly agree that I think um, pelvic manipulation has a role, especially for um, improving some of the scar tissue after surgeries, repeated surgeries for endometriosis. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's kind of a sad note to finish, yeah. endometriosis to finish on. So we'll finish um, uh, on the note of seeing if there are any other questions that I haven't answered that we haven't talked about. Transition, transition, lots of people talking about transition. Yeah. It's about trusting your body, knowing it's not going to last forever. The peak, the post-pill symptoms peak about six months off the pill. That's my experience. Post-pill hair loss, post-pill skin, you know, lack of periods. Usually around the six-month mark, you can really expect to turn the corner. And it's good just to know that too as kind of a roadmap of where you're going. It's like knowing it's not that your sort of current withdrawal experience off the pill is not how it's always going to be relearning kind of finding your way back to how your body really is yeah and you know that can be a really joyful experience because you're like getting to know yourself uh in a way that maybe you never had a chance to and gosh that's really pow it's really powerful it's really powerful to start to feel functioning healthfully again and starting to feel yourself coming back alive in a way in your in your femininity and I and I'm really excited about that part well and even I'll add to that even if you're not yet you know those first six months function if you don't perceive yet that you're functioning healthily it's also just checking in with what does my body need it's like okay I'm not functioning healthily my skin is you know not great or I'm not ovulating so let me you know just listen to my body think about what and listening might mean symptoms it might mean doing more blood tests you know trying to just work out in what way can i yeah support and help my body back to what mm -hmm. it wants to do mm -hmm. um i want to say something about um pleasure and orgasm and natural hormone balance that happens when um when we're enjoying our bodies and i feel like we can get really we can get really analytical and um talk about talk about the hormones in a, in a in a way that feels clinical and then there's another conversation on the table that i am really passionate about with with working with clients that this this is a step towards being an orgasmic woman and being fully empowered in your sensuality and your sexuality when you take your body back in in a way and one of the best ways to help your body transition off the pill into healthy functioning um, in your in your cycle is to allow yourself to have pleasure and to understand what pleasure is for you and to, to own 
finding pleasure for yourself. And it doesn't have to come from your partner. It can come from you. And uh, I like to work with these, these pleasure explorations and figuring out what makes what makes you tick sexually. And I find this to be a really empowering conversation, a really empowering discovery for women. And it kind of shifts the, shifts the focus off of what's going wrong with me to what feels good. And that, um, I wanted to see what you said about what you might have to say about, um, about orgasm and healthy hormone balancing. It's a good question. I don't have a specific, I mean, I think it's, it's beneficial. And I think you're right, it doesn't have to come from a partner. It's not about you know what kind of relationship you're in or it you know i think it i think it's important um you know for just for the and for sort of mood and yeah i, I guess i don't i don't work a, in that way a lot with my patients but i mean i think it mm. sounds fascinating i think it's i can yeah, support that <laughs> cool well yeah. i do and it is yeah. um and it's it's pretty, it's pretty remarkable the changes that happen for my clients when they, when they shift out of the mindset of their sexuality being uh, in service to someone else and taking control and ownership of finding what feels good for them. It really is quite remarkable. And uh, it's kind of, it's kind of a uh, like squirmy topic for a lot of people talking about sex and sensuality because um, there's a there's a shame there's a shame blanket that's kind of laid over the whole thing and and it's um, it doesn't need to be that way and um, it really could change the game completely. This is kind of what I was hinting at about the mindset. If you're feeling like uh, it's shameful to masturbate and you want to have a natural hormone balanced a period cycle there's a there's a there's a there's a to kind of disconnect happening there inside of you so um yeah that conversation is as actually something that i address in another webinar that i'll um I'll put a little link I to right no, I, agree. I, think I think it's important to put that masturbation is normal completely normal and and as you say probably quite important for Sort of just mood and knowing ourselves, and I, I agree with that. Yeah, um, and also just in final, I mean, so to broaden that out a little bit, I think it's this is what you're talking about. Partly is not we've had this separation between with this our health and then there's kind of our female health and our sexual health as a separate in a separate box almost, kind of as a separate thing. And one of my messages is, you know, our female hormones and our menstrual health is is an integral part of. Our total health is an expression of our health you know it, so it, it feeds into our health because we need those hormones they're you know beneficial for us so it's about yeah bringing it all back into as a whole woman it includes all of these these things they're not just the territory for the gynecologist or you know it's <laughs> not a separate yeah. issue yeah definitely <laughs> definitely yeah. and I think taking that even a step further our our the this 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 relationship we have with our sexual health is intricately connected to our whole health, intricately connected to our reproductive health. And damn, the, the statistics are just staggering with um, the, the number of women who are, who are dealing with sexual trespass at some point in their life. And this creates a, a, a disconnect. And until that bridge has been kind of crossed for a woman to kind of look at that and express how that feels for her to kind of process that whole experience. There's going to be a disconnect with her body and there's going to be a disconnect with her, her, her rhythm and her sensuality and, and her period is going to reflect that in a way. And I, I see that that conversation ha is happening in the way that we look at whole body health. And uh, I, I want to include sexuality in that conversation. It's, I think it's really important. And I do so in a webinar, very, um, powerful webinar that I've uh, I've shown everybody here. Um, I want to invite you to come watch that webinar too if this is kind of piquing your interest to talk about um, four major shifts that um, you can have tomorrow that will launch you into feeling like an empowered woman. The, the one that you know that you really are inside but that you maybe have some layers of shame and doubt and fear and and pain that are holding you back. And so um, this is my passionate uh, pitch to come come over to the next webinar and check that out. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I want to also share with you all a um, 
link for Lara's book. Sorry, I'm trying to figure this out. Do you want to talk about your book a little bit while I uh, figure out yeah. how to do that? Yeah, okay, well, we'll, we'll sort of finish up with that. So my, it's, um, I released it sort of early last year. It's a kind of, it's a compilation of basically everything I've learned in the last 20 years that work for periods. You know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of just practical advice about nutrition. I'll actually show, I've got it here. Just happy to have it here. Um, oh wait, there we go. Um, See that period repair manual? Yeah. So I just looked, I put um, a photo of, of it here too. Nutrition and herbal medicine and um, nutritional supplements and sort of how, how to use them safely and how to use them effectively and how to kind of, as I said, be the detective and hopefully with, you know, with the doctor's help, with your doctor's help, try to figure out what it is, what I was talking about before, about what your body needs from you to be able to do what it wants to do, which is to have healthy periods, like regular, painless, you know, easy periods with, with no PMS that that's, I've raised that I'm raising the bar of expectation around menstrual health. I truly believe that's possible for most women. Yeah, I agree. I think, uh, the standard, uh, narrative about PMS is actually sad. Um, and I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot going on with, um, the way that we, talk to ourselves and treat ourselves and the way that we kind of deny this deep wisdom of our own of our own womb you know our womb knows our pussy knows our reproductive health it has wisdom that we can tap into at any time and when we deny ourselves that and we disconnect from that there's a feeling of self-betrayal that happens and from an ayurvedic perspective and many health um models around the world that's the beginning of disease and so when um, when we kind of come back to that, we feel the expansiveness, and then we can deal with hormone fluctuation. We can we can deal with um, f feelings of intense emotions, or the whole the whole range of human emotion is so much more. Um, we can process and metabolize when we're not in opposition with ourselves in that way. I love it that you're that you're setting a goal for uh, for <laughs> setting the bar. Yeah, yeah. Our, yeah. For easy periods. Our, our cycles could be beautiful. Why aren't they? That's a good question. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, cool. Does anybody have any further um, any last questions for us before we uh, before we sign off here? Um, I just want to thank everyone for coming out today, the listeners. It's great. Yeah, definitely. This has been, um, it's been really wonderful having you all here and interact and giving us um, the opportunity to share our passions. Um, I'm not sure why you showed up today. It could be because you want to get off the pill, but it could be something bigger. Like it, you could, you could actually be secretly wanting to own your sexuality you could be wanting to feel really whole and healthy you could be wanting to kind of return to a natural state of being and there are a lot of um, a lot of amazing gifts in this webinar and i really i'm so grateful that we had a chance to share great um amy asks i've been diagnosed with pcos and i'm suffering post pill symptoms such as acne and no period. I'm worried the gynecologist will want me to go back on the pill. I kind of feel like that maybe we talked about that already. Yeah. Well, that's a common. It's Amy's question. This is a. It is a common experience. Like Amy, you're not alone. It's. I mean, a, a, I dive into a lot of this on my in my blog. I, I have a very sort of practical approach. So you know how to deal with post pill acne. How to just giving laying out some timelines of how long this is going to last. Hopefully, giving some realistic expectations of you know, what with the right diet and supplements, how it's going to work to give you hope because you're right. The, the gynecologist is going to say that they're just, the doctors are kind of like, I don't get, the, I don't understand. Like what's the big deal? Just go back on the pill. You know, it'll fix your skin. It'll get the story over. And so, but we know all of us in this group today talking about it, we know the truth now. It's, it's not, you know, it's, it's not that simple and it's, it's hard to say no to a doctor. It's hard to disagree with what a doctor is saying. I know that, but, you know, your body has a different plan. Your body would really like to find a way. So short answer, almost my whole, really my, 
I guess if my whole book is about kind of coming off the pill. It's about how to fix your periods, you know, get them back. And there's, there's hopefully an answer for you in the book or in my blog, or please do comment on my blog. I try to reply to a lot of comments there. I know everybody's situation is a bit different. So I try to kind of give perhaps, you know, into it and a different angle on someone's story that they might not have thought about before so read and you can read there's thousands of comments on my blog post you can read through what some other people's stories were their experiences what worked for them laura what's your website where's your blog where can people yeah. find info it's laurabryden.com laura bryden's healthy hormone blog yeah just search laura bryden pcos <laughs> you'll get it as well it's probably you know a number of sort of other guest blogs i've written for people it's a really rich blog. I, I, uh, I really, I share your stuff all the time. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It was yeah. lovely talking to you, Sarah. It's been a really, yeah, special, interesting conversation, a bit different than a lot of the conversations I've, I've had. Yeah, I like that we'd, we'd looked at it from a more of a, yeah, like in a, from a different way, more of sort of emotionally and um, yeah. energetically what it means to be a woman. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really, I'm passionate about, it's, you know, my story, it, I, I came from, a, I came from sexual trespass. I had a victim mentality for a really long time and I saw men as, a, as oppressors and I had a real disassociation and disconnection with my sensuality and I suffered in my, in my, in my expression through, through through PMS and through painful periods and hormone craziness. And when I, when I started changing my mindset around my sensuality and, and came to myself in a way where I trust myself and I feel like I am not, I do not feel shameful about being sensual and being a, a, a essentially and sexually awake woman. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. There's something that's really beautiful and profound and fucking powerful about that. And when that changed for me, my my relationship with with sex changed. I started having intense intense orgasms that I swear my my body and DNA rewires and I I know that there's a hormonal flush of good um, energy and and the the chemicals that happen the the way that my body feels when i when i orgasm like that that promotes health and healing from from the deepest levels all the way out and i i just can't i just can't um i can't sit still and shut up about the com the, the way the conversation <laughs> is you, you know w w so pathology focused all the time even in women's health i i think that there's so much pleasure to be had and and, and the conversation can be can be about what makes us feel good and empowered instead of what makes us feel bad. And so that's me and my soapbox. I really, I really <laughs> think that um, I'm, I'm glad that you're open to having this conversation with me because I think that you are on the fringe of, uh, of maybe your, your, <laughs> your industry. You're talking about things that a lot of other doctors are not. And, and so am I. And so we're kind of having this interesting meeting of the minds in this, in this webinar. And <laughs> I think people are getting quite a unique, synergy with the both of us yeah here we are okay. yeah. so um my website is saralubodyworks.com and um you can get a hold of me and check me out i really want to promote uh if this is a turning you on and turning you <laughs> into yourself check out my webinar and check out lara's book and uh and do stay in touch this has been a really uh really profound experience sharing with you also. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Lara. Okay.